भद्रम कर्णे भी शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येक्षजत्रा स्थिरंग सस्तनु व्यशेम देवित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्व स्वस्ति नस्ताक्षो अरिष्टने स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शाति 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 ओम ओ वेदिक गॉड्स मे वी हियर ऑस्पिशियस वर्ड्स विद आर इयर्स वाइल एंगेज इन सैक्रिफाइसिस मे वी सी ऑस्पिशियस थिंग्स विद द आईज वाइल प्रेजिंग द गॉड्स विद स्टडी लिम्स मे वी एंजॉय अ लाइफ दैट इज बेनिफिशियल टू द गॉड्स May Indra of ancient fame be auspicious to us. May the all-knowing Pusha, God of the earth, be propitious to us. May Garuda, the destroyer of evil, be well disposed towards us. May Brihaspati ensure our welfare. Om. Peace. 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 So we have started uh, studying the Mundaka Upanishad. A quick summary of where we are, and then we shall proceed. What we have seen so far is this ancient knowledge was transmitted from guru to disciple since ancient times. And where the text picks up is a disciple Shaunaka comes to the guru Angiras and poses a question. The question is, Kasminu bhagavo vigyate sarvam idam vigyatam bhavati iti. O revered sir, by knowing what? One thing. But knowing which one thing is everything here, here meaning in this universe, whatever I experience, everything that I experience in life, all of it will be known. So what is that one thing? What's behind this question? Behind the question is the idea that if I know the cause, I know the effect. Or the material cause, I know the effect. If I know what gold is, I know essentially what golden ornaments are, essentially. If I know what water is, I know what waves and foam and surf and raindrops and the water in the glass, all of that, what it is, I know. Uh, if I know what, you know, so on, I know what wood is, so I know all the wooden furniture, I understand what it is, essentially, in, in its substantial nature, in, in its reality. Not in detail. So a variety of ornaments may be produced. Who knows what will be produced today or what has been produced in the past. I may not know the details, the forms of those ornaments, nor their names, but I know what they really are. They really are nothing other than the gold which I know. So if you know the cause, you know the effect. And what Shaunaka is asking the Guru, is there one cause for this entire universe? And of course, Vedanta says Brahman is the cause of the universe. There is one cause and it can be known. And in fact, the most remarkable thing is that you are that Brahman. So the Guru starts instructing him. First of all, he makes a distinction based on the question. There are two kinds of things to be known. There's two kinds of knowledge. Paravidya, aparavidya. The supreme knowledge and the relative knowledge. Transcendent knowledge and relative knowledge. Higher knowledge and lower knowledge. Knowledge of the cause is the higher knowledge. And knowledge, the detailed knowledge of the effects is the lower knowledge. Spiritual knowledge of the one reality is the higher knowledge. And all the sciences and the arts and the humanities, whatever we do in this world, that is the lower knowledge. So he makes this distinction. Then he says that um, that by which, and he gives a list of all the lower knowledge, the four Vedas, the six auxiliaries and everything. And that by which we know the one imperishable, that's the higher knowledge. Thereby indicating that there is an ultimate cause of the universe, which he calls Akshara, the imperishable. And then he goes on to explain what this, in, in, or indicate what this imperishable is. He uses a string of negatives. It can't be seen or heard. It's not an object of the senses. It's not an object of the, of the motor organs. You can't see it, hear it, smell it. You can't walk to it or catch hold of it. And by extension, our instruments also can't, can neither um, know it, nor they, can they manipulate it, um, and so on. And then the question would be, all right, suppose such a thing is there, you know, Suppose Brahman is there, pure consciousness, pure being. But what about the question that the student asks? 
the student might think, I ask, tell me one thing by knowing which I know everything here. So if you say that there is some imperishable reality, okay, there might be. How does that help me? Because I want to know one thing by which I can know everything here. And then the teacher says, that one Brahman, which I indicated through negatives, not this, not that, is also the source of all the things in this universe. The entire universe emerges from Brahman. Brahman is the cause and the universe is the effect. Um, the wise, the enlightened, here in this life, by living this life, they see that cause in and through everything, just as you might see um, clay in all pots, just as you might see gold in all golden ornaments. Exactly like that, the enlightened one sees Brahman in and through all the effects. What are the effects? This universe. What's that like? How is this one Brahman the producer of this entire universe? Then the teacher replied with three examples. Um, he says, as a spider produces a we the web from its own body. Yeah. So for the web, the spider is the material cause because the web is produced from its own body. And also the intelligent cause because the spider is a sentient being spinning a web. Similarly, Brahman, the god of this of religion, you know, Saguna Brahman, Brahman with attributes, is the material cause of this universe and the intelligent cause of this universe. That's, the, that's what that spider example means. Now, one might question there that, uh, all right, spider, but spider puts in a lot of effort in making a web. And so does God have to work really all that hard to make this universe? And also, the web example is a little um, inadequate because the web is just one kind of thing. The spider makes a web, that's it. But the universe is diverse, is enormously diverse. So the next example answers these two questions. Just as from the earth, herbs and plants and trees emerge of a variety, and they emerge effortlessly. The earth doesn't have to work hard. Just they, they emerge from the earth, all sorts of plants and herbs and trees and so on. So a variety, the universe of tremendous variety, emerges effortlessly from Brahman. Um, so is Brahman like a force of nature? You know, many people, when they hear Advaita, they try to match it, not their fault, but they try to match it with their knowledge of science. You know, They say, oh, it's some kind of energy or it's some kind of um, something. They match it with super strings or quarks. Or... No, no, no. All that is matter. That is matter and energy. That's not Brahman. Um, or that's not Brahman in itself. Then, so is just like the earth is an insentient thing, you know, it's, and plants emerge from that. Uh, is it like that? Is Brahman an insentient thing? No. The third example is just like from the living human body, hair and nails and all that, they emerge. Similarly, Brahman is consciousness, is awareness. Um, in fact, the source of all sentience. And from that emerges a non-sentient uh, universe. Universe which is, uh, borrows its existence and awareness from Brahman. Uh, existence, awareness and purpose. Sat, Chit, Ananda, borrowed from Brahman. So the universe emerges. Just like the hair is not a living thing, emerges from a living body. The nails are not a living thing. They emerge from a living body. Similarly, the universe, which is um, diverse emerges from the one Brahman. The universe, which is non conscious, Jada, emerges from the consciousness, Brahman, Chetana. The universe, which is uh, impermanent, Anitya, emerges from the permanent. You see, from Brahman, a very dissimilar universe appears. That's the meaning of that uh, example. Um, so the words used are Yatha, Tatha, Yatha, just like. Just like what? The spider. Earth and shrubs and herbs. As from the living human body emerges uh, hair and nails and so on. Hair basically. Tatha. Tatha means like that. So these are examples. Like that. Um, like that, from the imperishable, 
appears, emerges um, this universe. Now, um, next, he's going to give details um, about the emergence of the universe from one Brahman. See, the way this teaching has been structured, the question was, tell me one thing by knowing which I'll know everything. Now, he has told you that one thing. The teacher has told you that one, there's one imperishable reality. But he has to show how this everything has come from that one thing. Therefore, if I don't understand the connection between gold and ornaments, I won't understand what is meant by, by knowing gold, you know all the ornaments. I have to see how that, that gold is these ornaments, how the you know, goldsmith carved or uh, molded these ornaments out of this gold. So how does from Brahman, how is this universe um, crafted or how does it emerge? Basically, a very the story of creation, but in a very philosophical way. Now, on to the next mantra. More details about the emergence of the universe. Eighth mantra. Tapasachiyate Brahma Tatovannam Abhijayate Annat Pranamana Satyam Loka Karma Suchamritam Very melodious Sanskrit. Through knowledge, Brahman increases in size. From that is born food, the unmanifested. From food evolves prana, the Hiranyagarbha. Thence the cosmic mind, thence the five elements, thence the worlds, thence the immortality that is in karma. What's all this? All right. The point is that there is a sequence. When from the one, the many comes. From Brahman comes this universe. There's a sequence. It's not accidental or it's not random. Um, Shankaracharya, in his leading uh, commentary to this mantra, before the mantra starts, he makes an observation. Yad Brahmana utpadyamanam vishwam tadanena kramena utpadyate. So the whole universe is going to come from Brahman, but it comes in a sequence, and the sequence is going to be mentioned. Na yugapat badara mushti prakshepavad iti. Krama Nima Niyama Vivakshita Artha Ayam Mantra Arabhyate. So he says it's not like you have a, a handful of berries, they're jujubes, you know, uh, there's a little fruit, like a small berry. So if you take a handful of that, Shankaracharya says a handful of these small berries and you suddenly scatter them, there's a random scattering. Does the universe appear like that? Just like a blast, you know, suddenly everything comes all at the same time. Like that, or is there a sequence? And he says, the Upanishad says, there is a sequence. And what's that sequence? We're going to see that now. Um, I'll tell you what the sequence is first, and then we'll go into the mantra itself. Um, there are two views on this. There is a more radical, non-dualistic view, which actually says the universe appears just like that. Because it's not a real production. Nothing has really come. The universe is Brahman, existence, consciousness, bliss, all the time. There is no particular sequence because there is no emergence anyway. It's an appearance, like a dream. So you might, you might be in a dream, walking around, talking with people, things might be happening. And in the dream also, there might be a story that the world evolved like this. You know, the universe started and the worlds were created. Life evolved and... Uh, um, you know, the human beings came on this planet and history. And then finally, we are here talking with each other and walking around in, you know, uh, on the streets here in Manhattan. And that's the sequence. But is that true? Is that true? It's not true. Because we know when we wake up, none of that happened. It was just a dream. It appeared all by itself. And there was no um, multi-billion year, year old evolution to come to that point in the dream. It, it is uh, a projection of the mind. Similarly, there is a radical non-dual view which says that the entire universe appears like that. There is really no, I mean, it's all a story within that appearance. Really, these things did not ha happen because the world, after all, is an appearance. In that appearance, you can tell the story of uh, a sequence and everything. That's a radical view. Um, all that uh, is not taken into account here. If you go to the Upanishads, in general, the Upanishads speak about a sequence. And so, 
what is that sequence? I'll tell you, I'll give you the finished product first, but here we are going back to the construction materials, you know, the finished product, which you come across in later texts. So we studied Vedanta Sara. There in detail, this sequence was talked about. I'll sum up in a couple of minutes. But remember, Vedanta Sara is a much later text. It was written about 700, 800 years ago. Where did they get all that from? They got it from the Upanishads, but not from any one Upanishad. All these Upanishads, most of them, they talk about a sequence in the emergence, creation, whatever, projection, whatever you want to say of the universe. So studying all of that together, putting it together, using reason, you have a model, like a standard model, which, can, which is taught to Vedanta students. So what's the standard finished model, the finished, finished product? It goes something like this. Brahman is existence consciousness bliss. Maya, which is the three gunas, you know, sattva, rajas, tamas, which is neither ultimately real, because only Brahman can be ultimately real in Advaita Vedanta. Um, Maya is a set of potentialities, names and forms. Um, and this Maya projects Brahman as um, the five elements, um, the you know space and uh, air and fire and water and earth, the, the cosmic elements. And these elements are in what is called a subtle form, sukshma. And these subtle elements combine together, they form mind. The mind is formed of the Mind is formed of sky, uh, air, fire, water, earth, and so on. But they're in the subtle form. They are not in the physical form which we see. So mind is formed of that. Mind, intellect, prana, all of that is formed. When uh, these subtle elements combine together to make more gross elements, out of the gross elements, these worlds are produced. And they talk about 14 worlds being produced. And in that, our bodies are produced, living bodies. And the minds come to reside in these living bodies. And they are, you know, the sentient beings who are basically reflections of Brahman in these minds. Uh, they, um, they continue. Where do, where do the sentient beings come from? They have their seeds in Maya. In Maya, all of our past, in past universes, our uh, samskaras, our karma is all recorded. They are just inscribed on, onto the minds when the minds are produced. These bodies, living bodies, they're born, they age, they die. And there are many, many such bodies. We go through these sentient beings, uh, which are none other, other than Brahman, limited by Maya, with its own, with each with their own destinies formed by past karma. They um, are downloaded, let's say, uh, into these uh, minds. And the minds are downloaded into these bodies each time a body is born. And then they go through their destinies on these 14 universes, which are created by um, by Ishwara, by, by Saguna Brahman, until each death attain their uh, enlightenment and they're released from these cages of mind-body cages and they attain their realization as Brahman. And the universe goes on for some time and finally Saguna Brahman or God dissolves this universe, withdraws the physical universe into the subtle, subtle universe back into Maya. Maya is the causal universe. That's the story. So that's what we saw in uh, Vedanta Sara. Um, now, where did the standard model of cosmos is called cosmology? So cos Vedanta cosmology, where did it come from? Vedanta claims everything that we speak about comes from the Upanishads. So, how do you ground these theories in the Upanishads? Take a look at the Upanishads. Various Upanishads they have these ideas, these teachings about creation in different language. Mundaka Upanishad is one of the more clearer ones, but even here you will see uh, there are arcane words and uh, terminologies. They don't exactly match the standard model, but you remember the standard model has been put together by consulting multiple Upanishads and coming to a consensus about. The general pattern is you will recognize here. What's the general pattern? The general pattern is ultimate reality is Brahman. That's always there. Now, in association with Maya, which is not ultimate reality according to Advaita Vedanta, which is part of the projection, part of the movie, part of the fiction. In association with Maya, Maya is like a seed state. Maya is basically the, the uh, set of names and forms which will come out. It's like a potential state. In association with Maya, Brahman is called God. I mean, the name in Vedanta would be Saguna Brahman, Ishwara, 
Bhagavan, multiple names. It corresponds to the God of all theistic religions. Why does it do that? Because the idea of God in all theistic religions is God is the creator of the universe. That's the one common definition. So creator of the universe, but also the repository of all great qualities, um, you know, blessed qualities, omniscient, omnipotent, um, uh, omnipresent, uh, all loving, all powerful, all of that. So maximum of good quality. So all of that is found in Saguna Brahman or Ishwar or Bhagavan. So this is called the causal state. What's the causal state? Brahman plus Maya. Why is it called causal state? Because it's like a seed. Um, all the names and forms which we will see at this universe, this entire universe of variety is found in that Maya, but in an indistinguishable state. Just as a tree with all its branches and leaves and flowers and fruits is, is actually that one little seed. If you examine the seed, you won't find fruits and flowers and leaves, but the potentiality is there. All the information and power for generating a tree under suitable circumstances is there in the seed. Um, so that's why Maya is like that. Maya is called a causal state. The seed is the causal state of the tree, future tree. Another beautiful example, which you find used in Kashmiri Shaivism, is of the peacock. The peacock has a dazzling display of feathers. One of some of the most magnificent colors found in nature is found in the, the tail of the peacock. When it dances, it unfurls the tail and dances. But the Kashmiri Shaivas say that all that display of amazing color and beauty, uh, magnificence, it's all there in the egg of the peacock. The yolk of the egg, uh, which is colorless fluid um, or just one color maybe. That in potential form, it contains all the magnificent display of colors which you find in the feathers of a peacock. Similarly, in Maya, you find this tremendously varied, variegated universe. But in Maya, you will not find the differences. It's just in a potential form, in a seed form, in a causal form. Then what happens? This Ishwara, which is Brahman plus Maya, the technical terms to be precise here, Brahman not plus, is limited by Maya. Maya avachinna chaitanya, consciousness limited by Maya. What does it do? It produces a subtle universe, a subtle universe of mind of subtle elements and mind, prana, mind, all of that. And then from that comes the physical universe of the worlds and bodies and all. So the gross universe. So here are the stages. The sequence is like this. Brahman, always there. Brahman plus Maya is Saguna Brahman, Ishwara, Bhagavan, causal state. Then mind, the cosmic mind, Hiranyagarbha, subtle state. And then the physical universe, Virat or Vishwarupa. So this is the sequence of creation. One way of understanding this very clearly in our own experience is to look at our experience of deep sleep, dreaming and waking. Our deep sleep state is like the causal state. It's like Brahman plus Maya. Everything that we experience in this world, our whole personality is there in that causal state. But we don't experience any difference there, any uniqueness there, just blank. You, you, uh, there's no distinction between subject and object in deep sleep. But in potential form, everything is there. That's why when we fall asleep, we are not destroyed. We come back again, the same person like again. So the deep sleep state can be called the causal state, karana. In Sanskrit, karana avastha, causal state. And our dream state can be called the subtle state. We have an entire world which is all in the mind. It's all in imagination in the mind. In Sanskrit, sukshma avastha. And then we wake up into an apparently physical world, solid world out there. We're in the middle of it with a physical body in a physical world that is called the gross state or physical state in Sanskrit, sthula avastha. Exactly like that, in the cosmic level, Brahman proceeds through a causal state, subtle state and gross state to create this entire universe. The causal state is called Ishwara or Saguna Brahman. The subtle state is called Hiranyagarbha, the cosmic mind. And the um, physical state is called Virat, the cosmos, basically. All right. Now, same thing, but with 
unfamiliar terms. Let me go to the actual mantra and we will see. So tapasa chi yate brahma. Um, tapasa. What, what happens in this creation? By, tap, by tapa, tapa means austerity. Uh, you know, all the spiritual practices we do are called tapas, tapas or tapasya. No, no, Brahman undergoes this tapasya. But what is this tapasya of Brahman? What, what, this is a poetic way of putting it. So Shankaracharya says, um, Jnanena utpatti vidhi jnataya bhuta yoni aksharam brahma. The tapa, the austerity, the spirit, the practice of Brahman, which Brahman undergoes, supposedly, quote unquote, before the creation of the universe, is just knowledge. So, Ishwara or God or Saguna Brahman has the knowledge of creation, has the, the knowledge of how, how to create this universe and the power to create this universe. So, that is called Jnana in Utpatti Vidhi Jnataya. So, Vidhi Jnataya. That means the one who has the power of, uh, who, who knows the way of creating this universe. Chiyate expands Brahman, again within quotes, as if, it is as if Brahman expands, you know, at the moment of creation. And Shankaracharya gives two examples to explain this. One is a seed. So just before the seedling sprouts, it swells up. The seed swells up just a little bit. And Shankaracharya uses this example. Jagad ankuram eva bija. Just before the seedling sprouts, the seed swells up a little bit. So this, uh, just before the universe is created, as if Brahman swells up a little bit. Swells up a little bit. Or second example, he says, Shankaracharya says, just like parents are uh, delighted uh, as they produce a child. In the birth of a child, the parents are delighted. So Brahman, Harshena, he says, in the, as if Brahman with delight, uh, as if swells up. Of course, there's no physically swelling up or mentally, there's, there's no physical universe yet. There's no mental universe yet. But as if. But swells up with what? He says, Tato Annam Abhijayate. Uh, he, he gives an example. Uh, Shankaracharya ex explains. Sarvagyataya, srishti sthiti sanghara shakti vigyanavattaya upachitat has swells up with the, um, this omniscience, the knowledge of creation, maintenance and dissolution of the universe. And knowledge and power, he says, um, shakti vigyan, it's not just theory. Ishwar or Bhagavan has the, this omniscience of creating the universe and the power of creating that. What happens then? In God, at this causal state itself, he makes a distinction. Annam abhijayate. Literally, if you translate it, it means food appears. But food here means, Shankaracharya explains, bhujyate iti annam. That which is consumed is food. So whatever in future, all sentient beings will experience. The words, our own bodies, our thoughts, our you know, see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and actual food also, which we will eat. All of that is contained in a potential form in Brahman now as a set of names and forms. You know, as the all set of all possibilities. Like all the colors in dazzling colors in a peacock's tail is contained in that colorless yolk of the egg. In the same way, all these possibilities, this is called annam. Literally, annam, of course, in Sanskrit and in Indian languages means food. But food here means all the consumable, all objective manifestation. Now that is still in the causal state. It's just a set of names and forms, which um, Sri Ramakrishna put it in his inimitable way, very simple way. He says at the end of a harvest, the old lady of the house, he uses the term buddhi. So what she goes, she goes out into the fields where everything has been harvested. She collects the seeds, the seeds. And she puts it into little cloth bundles because those will be, they will be sown for the next harvest. Who's that lady, old lady? She is Maya. And what are all the seeds? This is this annam, which she will take out of her pot the next time <laughs> they are going to sow the field and you know, start a new crop. Similarly, the, 
it's like the old lady now rummaging around in her pot and getting ready to pull out the seeds. So that is the causal state. That is the state of annam. Nothing has been done yet, but everything is in a potential form. Tato annam abhijayate. Ah. Then what happens? Annat prano manasatyam loka karma suchamritam. From annam, from that potentiality, from the causal state, the subtle state appears. What is the what is the subtle state? Here two things have been mentioned: prana and mana. Prana is a technical term often found in the Upanishad. It, re, uh, it refers to Hiranyagarbha, the cosmic mind. One good way of understanding this is when we emerge from deep sleep in our daily experience, when we emerge from deep sleep into a waking, into a dream, when dreams kick, start off, kick off again. We have not woken up, but we are not in deep sleep. Dreams are happening. Similarly, the cosmic mind awakens. In iconography, this is shown as Vishnu, who is always reclining on the cosmic serpent, Sheshanaga, in his navel, what happens? A lotus blooms. And Brahma, not Brahman, Brahma is depicted sitting there with four heads looking in the four directions. Um, so, um, Brahma emerges. Who is Brahma? Prana or Hiranyagarbha, the cosmic mind. So, Hiran, this is the, that's the second stage that Hiranyagarbha, the subtle creation has started now, cosmic mind. One another way of looking at the same thing is the five sheets, the five sheets of the human personality. You have the physical body, which is called Annamaya, the food sheet, the pranic body, which is called Pranamaya, the mental body called Manomaya, the body of the intellect called uh, Vijnanamaya, and the causal body, which we experience in deep sleep called anandamaya so when anandamaya is there that's the causal state when vidyanamaya manomaya and pranamaya are produced that's the subtle state which is where we are now and finally when the anandamaya is uh, the the annamaya the food sheet is produced that's called the physical state same thing i'm telling you in different ways so when hiranyagarbha appears shankaracharya says jnana kriya shakti adhishthita Jagat Sadharana. Hiranyagarbha, cosmic mind appears. For the first time, you find the, the powers, threefold power. Power of knowing, power of willing, and the power of doing. These are powers which emerge with the emergence of the mind. In Maya, all the powers are there. Maya itself is power. But those powers are not active. In deep sleep, all your powers are there, which is not active. When you dream, activity begins. When you think, activity begins. So, jnana, kriya, shakti. Uh, here, um, I, so uh, he, he, here he has just mentioned the power of knowledge and power of doing. Jagat sadharana. This Hiranyagarbha is common to the entire universe because from that Hiranyagarbha, all of us have come. So everywhere, another name for Hiranyagarbha is sutra, the thread. Um, you know, in a garland, when you weave a garland of flowers or a garland of pearls, there's a thread running through all the flowers. There's a thread running through all the pearls. Similarly, in this vast universe, there's a thread running through all of us. A thread of divinity. That's the cosmic mind. Hiranyagarbha. The Jagat Sadharana. Common to the entire universe. And what will happen next? In this subtle creation, sentient beings will emerge. The seeds which the old lady has planted now. They will start sprouting. And that sprouting seeds will all be different. Till now, it's all common. But they all be different from each other now when the sprouts emerge. Who are the sprouts? Us. But in what condition? As, as mental beings, as sentient beings, not yet with bodies. So we have, um, he says, avidya kama karma bhuta samudaya bijankura jagat. So the entire collection of this world, all sentient beings, with their ignorance, with their old samskaras and desires and the action they are about to engage in, in this life, in this universe, they all begin to sprout. Yeah, but they are still at the mental level, at, at the subtle level. They don't have bodies or worlds yet. Then what happens? Annat pranamana. Cosmic mind and individual minds have emerged. And then um, satyam. 
So it already means that the subtle elements have been created. That's how the cosmic mind, individual minds have been created. Now he says satyam. Satyam here means, literally if you translate, it means truth or reality. But what it means here, the five elements. Bhuta panchakam abhijayate. Akashadi. Shankaracharya says, the five well-known elements, you know, he says, uh, satyakhyam akashadi, which are space and air and fire and water and earth um, these are these are called satyam you know it's interesting advaita vedanta will end up calling all of this mithya <laughs> appearances fall like a rope in like a snake in the rope and here in original in the upanishad they are all called real and later brahman will be called not in this upanishad another upanishad brahman is called satyasya satyam the reality of all all real things Anyway, so then all these elements emerge, five elements. And then what happens with these five elements? Lokaha, the universe emerges. The 14 worlds emerge. According to Vedanta, Vedantic old Indian cosmology, there are 14 universes. But the physical, basically the physical universe, which we experience now, that emerges. And then what happens? In that uh, physical universe, there are living bodies. And all these sentient beings, which existed in uh, Maya as the little seeds which the old lady had put in her pot. And then they sprouted in the cosmic mind as individual beings like us in the mind. And then now they are downloaded into these physical bodies as the physical bodies are created. It could be initially there will only be a set of bacteria or viruses. And then there will be multicellular organisms. There might be aquatic beings. Then there might be amphibians and dinosaurs and so on. And then finally, um, maybe at this present time, we've got human bodies. But the same beings are going from body to body over millions of years. So he says, um, living beings. Now living beings, what do they do? When they come to human form, they engage in further karma, in action. Why do they engage in karma? Due to karma, desire. Why do they have these desires? Due to avidya, ignorance. They don't know that they are Brahman. So because of that, they engage, avidya, kama, karma, Shankaracharya's famous equation, they engage in action. And once they engage in action, the actions give rise to results. And this is what the Upanishad says, karma suchamritam, these results are called immortality. What do you mean immortality? Shankaracharya explains here, kalpa koti shatei vinashyanti, they will not be destroyed for eons to come until they give rise to their results and you experience the results of your own actions, good and bad. That's why it's a kind of immortality. It's the fuel which propels this universe. Why does this universe continue? It's because of causality. Um, causes are set into motion. They're bound to give rise to effects. Um, actions will have con consequences. So because of this, the universe is going on. It's not real immortality. This is continuous change, continuous birth and death. And continuous suffering uh, until you realize the truth. So this is the grand view of the universe. Basically, um, ultimate reality still continues to be the same. Think about it like the gold, gold and the gold ornaments. Gold continues to be the same, but the goldsmith has a whole set of ideas which he wants to make into ornaments. And those ideas are the annam, the food, the causal state. They are not manifested yet. When he puts them down, let's say, in a diagram or a computer-aided um, design or something like that, that's the subtle state. Ornaments haven't been produced yet, but there are plants now. And then when he actually carves or molds those things into gold, and then you have the actual ornaments. So you have gone from a causal state, the goldsmith's own skill, talent, potential to create ornaments, to the subtle state where he actually makes designs for future ornaments, and then the physical state, where he actually makes those ornaments and puts the names and forms on the gold. What about the gold itself? Continues to be gold. It was just gold earlier. And when the plants were going on to make necklaces and bracelets, it was just gold. And when the, they were formed into necklaces and bracelets, it's just gold. Similarly, Brahman continues to be Brahman. When associated with Maya, now you can call it a new name. Bhagavan, Ishwara, God. Saguna Brahman. And when it produces, um, and in this, it takes out its set of 
you know, plans, potentialities. You give it a new name, Annam, you know, the, the set of potential names and forms. And when it produces a cosmic mind, you give it a new name, Hiranyagarbha. And uh, when it becomes a physical universe, you give it a new name, universe. But it's still the same Brahman. And you are that Brahman. Not a bit has changed as far as Brahman is, con uh, is uh, um, concerned, or as far as you are concerned. Now, one more mantra, and I will conclude this chapter. Um, why is he saying all this? Well, because we want to know how this universe is connected to this one reality. How, how you're talking about one having uh, is appearing as the many. The many have come from the one. How? So, give us a theory. And here's a theory. Advaita will finally say it's a story. You asked, so you're, you're getting a story. The real, the true, true story is that there's no story. Brahman alone remains. But anyway. Um, One observation here, you know, Advaita Vedanta is often talked about as Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. Brahman is real, the world is false. But notice, all this time when we have been discussing in the Upanishads, there's no hint of the falsity of the world. Brahman, from Brahman has emerged the world. How? Like web comes from the spider, like herbs and shrubs come from the um, earth, like hair emerges from your living body. Just like that, from the imperishable, all these perishable entities, variety, from the one, many have come, from the imperishable, the perishable have come, um, from limitless, pure being, uh, existing things, limited things have come. Nowhere is it said that all that you are seeing here is false and the Brahman alone is real. All that is a later development. It's only when you want to make sense of it um, through logic, then you are driven to the position the ultimate reality alone, that must be the ultimate reality. That alone is real. And the, the rest of it, what is being spoken here, must be of a lower grade of reality. Otherwise, you can't make sense of this. Now, one more mantra, and then we will stop. Yasarvagya sarvavid yasya jnanamayam tapaha tasmade tad brahmanama rupam annam chajayate And read the translation from Swami Gambhirananda. From him who is omniscient in general and all-knowing in detail, and whose austerity is constituted by knowledge, evolves this Brahman, derivative Brahman, name, color, and food. So what, what is being said here? Sarvagya Sarvavit. Two words have been used here. Sarvagya means all-knowing. Sarvavit means all-knowing. But they, they have two different meanings. The Sarvagya and Sarvavit, I'll give you a simple, uh, clear answer first. What does it mean? Why is the same thing said twice? Um, they are in two different senses. Sarvagya means knowing the cause. Sarvavit means knowing the effects individually. Sarvagya means you know gold. Sarvagya means all-knowing. So all-knowing in the sense of knowing the gold. Sarvavit means all-knowing in the sense of knowing the ornaments in detail. Suppose you know it's all gold, but you go to the uh, jewelry shop and you read the catalog. So somebody gave a box of chocolates. Now chocolates you just eat, but then now there are, there are fancy things. You know, like we open the box, you have to do, you have to read. Even to eat the chocolates, you have to read. And there is a list of different chocolates and they all have different names. And there are, of course, different uh, ingredients. But, but basically, if you know it's a box of chocolate, so even without reading, you know one thing. They are all chocolate. But when you read, you know, you come to know, oh, they have all these fancy names. And they have different shapes and different tastes and so and so forth. So the, the first one is Sarvagya, all-knowing in the sense of knowing the cause, the material, the reality itself. And the second one is Sarvavit, knowing everything in detail. It's an approximate example. Um, yeah. The first one is realizing your Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi. And you realize that, the enlightened one is Sarvagya in that sense. Uh, but to know everything in detail, you have to be the cosmic mind, Hiranyagarbha or Ishwara Bhagavan. God knows everything in detail. 
So it's like, you know, the entire library. You have to re read up everything about everything. You know, every subject and whatever has been written, you read it up, then you are knower of everything in detail. So these are the two meanings of the word omniscient. The first one, the enlightened one, you, I, we will all be omniscient when we are enlightened in that sense that we know everything is Brahman. But the detailed knowledge of everything, of every being that only God has, uh, or avatars, incarnations have. In the Bhagavad Gita, um, Arjun asks this question, you were born recently, just like me. And Krishna says, no, we have had many, many lives before. You and I and all these kings, I know them all. You have forgotten everything, Arjuna. So I know, I know them all. That means Krishna knows all, all his past incarnations. And he knows in detail all of Arjuna's past lives, whatever has happened to him and this present life and whatever is going to happen to him in this life and all his future, if there are any future lives at all. So Ishwara knows everything about us in detail. We know only one thing. If you become enlightened, don't become enlightened then you don't know anything. But if you become enlightened, then you know um, one thing, one thing in reality, that everything is Brahman. I am Brahman and I am that Brahman. And that's the saving knowledge. That's the real knowledge. Uh, so in Vedantic texts, Ishwara is called Sarvagya, all-knowing. And we are called Alpagya, little-knowing. So our knowledge is very frail. We struggle to get a little bit of knowledge from kindergarten to PhD. And that, after struggling, we promptly forget most of it. And later in old age, we sort of forget all of all of it, you know. And so that's the state of our knowledge. Terrible. Um, but God knows everything in detail. Sri Ramakrishna asks M, tell me, tell me in truth that I know everything about you, your past, present and future. And M actually suddenly overcome and he folds his hands and he bows down and he says, it is true. It is true. You, you know my past, present and future. Now what is that knowing the past, present and future? That is Ishwara, Bhagavan. Knowing everything in detail. Um, then, Jnana Mayam Tapa. So a little more explanation is given for the word austerity, which was used in the earlier ma mantra. You know, Brahman undergoing austerity to produ produce tapasya, to produce the universe. What does it mean? Jnana Mayam. It's, uh, it's, austerity is of the nature of knowledge. Brahman has the knowledge, it reflects on its past knowledge of how, all right, it's time to create a universe. So how do I do that? Well, you, you pull up all those old files from your hard drive and what did I do in the past universe? So that's the austerity of Brahman. It's of the form of knowledge. From this Brahman, what happens? From this Brahman, the other Brahman is born. What is the other Brahman? Uh, Hiranyagarbha. That means from Saguna Brahman, Hiranyagarbha is born. That's what was said earlier. Uh, and from that, what happens? Names and forms. Nama Rupa. The entire universe of names and forms is formed. So basically, um, the, the jeweler, uh, he puts into uh, action. He has designed, he has made designs for lots of uh, ornaments. Now he pulls out the gold and puts those names and forms on the. This one is shaped like this. It's called a bracelet. That one looks shaped like that. It's called a necklace and so on. This universe is produced. Annam. Here the word annam means actually consumable. All names and sights and, for, and, the, for, and the, you know, smells and tastes. Everything that we can refer to by language. And even down to the actual literal meaning of the word. The food that living beings dwell on. Which gives them energy you know, to carry on the activities of life. All of that is produced. All right. Um, so this ends the first chapter, which is very dense. A lot of things have been said. Now things will be expanded over the next few chapters. Let's see what um, reactions and questions we have here. Eka Jeeva Vada, Drishti Shishti Vada, step one. Uh, as a concession to a daily experience and requiring one of the Drishti. None, therefore, Ajata Vada endorsed by Bhagavan Ramana from direct realization. As well as Gaudapada, why not accept this definitive cosmology instead of going down the rabbit path of theories? All right, so what he's asking here is a very profound and deep question. Is that uh, you said universe is created in a sequence. So it's a theory, right? It's a cosmological theory. And you yourself admitted just a story. You ask, you're asking for a cause. You're asking for how all this happened. 
The real answer is it didn't happen. But if you want an answer, it's like you're running from a lion. I give this example sometimes in a dream. You don't know it's a dream and you're running and running. And uh, then a wise man turns up and you say, save me. And the wise man says, just wake up. Nothing happened. And he said, no, that's terrible. Can't you see the lion? Then what will the wise man do? The wise man will tell you, all right, climb a tree. It shows you the tree and you climb the tree. And then you have a question, where did the lion come from? You can see the wise man rolling his eyes. The lion came from its lion dad and lioness mom. Where did they come from? Well, they came from their lion dad and their lioness mom, from grandfather lion and grandma lion. None of it is true. The real answer is to wake up. But you have, you need these. Just yesterday in a class, somebody was asking, why not give them the direct truth? You know, from the Buddhist perspective, why go down these theories? Um, so the answer is, this is the way of giving them the direct truth. After all, what is all this? What's all this going on? Whether it's Upanishads or whatever, uh, you are trying to lead people to enlightenment. The masters are trying to lead us to enlightenment. Now, for many of us, if you directly tell me, look, just wake up, you're Brahman. Forget all this samsara. Just give it up. It's all um, nonsense anyway. That's too much. I can't, I can't uh, swallow that. I, I will not listen to you. I think you are crazy. And say, give up all this entire world. Well, I won't give it up. I'll give you up. <laughs> but I won't give up this world. Then you need to show me that there is an ultimate reality. And so, all right, there's an ultimate reality which has to be realized. Fine. But what about this world? This is real. You're saying some ultimate reality. This is real for me. Well, then you have to show me how this reality has come from that reality. And for that, stories are necessary. Um, or uh, theories are necessary. Cosmological theories. So that's why you have to. And the aim is still the same. To lead people to enlightenment. Um, very few people can digest <laughs> very strong you know, uh, like strong coffee or something like that, you know, it, it, it can upset the tummies of most people. So you need, Sri Ramakrishna said, the, uh, the mother cooks various kinds of dishes for the children. She knows which child has a sensitive stomach, which child can't, doesn't like spices, which child likes spicy food. And she makes this, out of the same dish, she makes five varieties for the five children. Yeah. So here, he, what he has asked is, see, in Advaita Vedanta, there are these three approaches to the, to the universe. You have to explain what is this universe, right? Three, three approaches. One is called uh, Srishti Drishti Vada. Second one is called Drishti Srishti Vada. Third one is called Ajata Vada. If I literally translate, the first one means creation and then seeing. That's the theory. The second one is seeing and then creation, or seeing is creation. Third one is nothing happened theory, <laughs> and the theory of no birth, ajata, no birth, no creation. What do they mean? The first one says that, yes, there was this one reality, but from that, by a process, which I will explain, this entire universe has come. Oh, do explain the process. Well, then, then comes in all these ancient cosmologies, from the creation stories, you know, in the scriptures of the world, to the more philosophical approaches, you find multiple approaches, which you find in the different Upanishads. Basically, a causal state, then a subtle state, and then a physical state. Science does the same thing, cosmology, um, with, on much more empirical grounds, much more rational grounds, using data and mathematics and all of that to argue your way back to that there's the possibility of a big bang at the beginning of everything. And then what happened? Then what happened? Whole sequence. So sequential creation. Universe was created. And now you are here and seeing the universe. Creation first, then seeing. Srishti, drishti. Srishti, creation. A projection. And then seeing. Drishti, to see. So now the universe was there. And now we are seeing this universe. We are, come, we are born into this world. And we are experiencing this universe. You can see this is a very common sense way of looking at it. That's how we feel. We, we feel this. And almost all the Upanishads and texts, they all take this position, but not all. Some are more radical. The more radical view is Drishti Shrishti. Drishti Shrishti is the second one, seeing first and then creation. Um, not that the universe was created. You are seeing it, that's what creates the universe. You, the conscious being, you see first. 
and then you, the universe is created. That, that seeing itself constitutes the creation of the universe. What does that mean? One very good way of understanding is dreaming and waking. In the waking world, what do we all feel? All of us. Whatever our theory is. What do we actually feel? We feel the world existed and I have come into this world and I'm looking around. I'm sort of passing my time in this world, having all kinds of experiences. But the world existed. I didn't exist. I was born into it. And very soon I won't exist, but the world will continue to exist. This is called Srishti Drishti Vada. Universe was created, then we have all come into it and we are experiencing it. Theory one, common sense theory. But in our dreams, what do we feel? When you wake up from a dream, what did you feel? The places you went to, the people you met, the good and bad things which happened, you realize, oh, I actually didn't go to those places don't exist outside my mind. Those people don't exist outside my mind. Those events did not happen outside my mind. It was all the dreaming mind. Just the dream itself was the universe. Dreaming created that universe. It's not that the universe was there and I went and saw it. It was dreaming itself that generated the universe, like a virtual universe. So that is that equivalent is Drishti Shrishti Vada. That's in a dream. Advaita claims in the waking world also exactly the same thing is happening. In this world you're seeing around, it doesn't exist. You are seeing, that's why it exists. Stop seeing, it won't exist. And the proof of it is, as long as you are there as the seer and experiencer, in the waking, in the dreaming, there is samsara. The moment you, the ego, the individual being, goes to sleep in deep sleep, samsara also disappears. You, the experiencer, and your experienced world, they arise together and they fall together. When do they arise? Dreaming, waking. When do they disappear? Deep sleep. But all three are appearing before you, the reality, pure consciousness. So that's the drishti shrishti example. The Drishti Shishti has some consequences which you must be ready to bear. Which means, you, in this waking state also, you'll have to regard this universe as a, uh, as a dream, as an appearance. Just like you regard your dreams. You are not bothered by your dreams. You should be ready to be not bothered by this waking universe also. Also, the big metaphysical consequence, an epistemological consequence of this theory is that um, you are the only being then. We are all appearing in your uh, dream. Just as in your dream, who is really there? You are there, nobody else. Although the whole universe seems to be there. So this leads to uh, a kind of, in philosophy, what is called a kind of solipsism. One knower. You are the knower. Eka jiva vada. There is one sentient being, you. In ignorance. And when you realize that you are Brahman, there is no more sentient being. You are Brahman. That's it. This is called drishti shrishti vada. And some, like Prakashananda, some later Advaitins, they held on to this belief, uh, this, this way of looking at the world. Um, it's easier if you are an all-renouncing monk. You know, just imagine, you have simply cut yourself away from everybody. You live in a forest or a mountain cave, and you hardly see a human face. It's all rocks and wind and ice. And literally, I'm talking from personal experience. Not a mountain cave, but I lived in a mountain hut for days and days on end. So I, I just stayed for a few months, a couple of months at one time. But I was imagining if somebody, I've seen monks like that who have stayed for 30 years, 40 years. Now the world very soon becomes dreamlike. The world in the plains, which I was there, in the big cities of India, is soon become dreamlike, like some faded memory. And you are living in this extraordinary place. So it helps you to dismiss the world as an appearance. Uh, but you know, the solid feel of the world begins to fade away. Um, and you have no connection with anybody in the world. So you have to be that, that kind of an extremely, you know, of a high, what is called a high degree of vairagya. In the Himalayas, they say, Bahut um, Phakkad Mahatma hai. That means a, com a person of tremendous renunciation. Vivekananda, I'll just read out to you. I just remember. Remembering, but sometimes Vivekananda is in that mood, extreme renunciation. He says here, this is the lecture called The Free Soul. And there, in volume three of the complete works of Vivekananda, in Free Soul, he says, he says here, 
Um, deny that there is any life at all because life is only another name for death. What a, I mean, to many people, it will be a horrifying statement. Everything that we hold to be real, worthwhile, he's just dismissing at one sweep. Deny that there is any life at all because life is only another name for death. Deny that you are a living being. Who cares for life? Life is one of those hallucinations and death is its counterpart. Be careful. It is not recommending suicide. One who, who commits suicide is deeply mired in ignorance. Because what is the logic behind suicide? If I destroy this body, I won't exist anymore. That means I am very solidly convinced I am this body. Not even a mind. I'm just this body. If I destroy this body, I won't exist anymore. So suicide is absolutely not being talked about here. Life is one of these hallucinations and death is its counterpart. You said life and death, both are hallucinations. Joy is one part of these hallucinations and misery the other part and so on. What have you to do with life or death? And we just say, what does he mean? We think all that we have to do is life and death. We are concerned with life and holding on to life like anything and we are terrified of death. That's everything that all about. That's the best description of all living beings, including all human beings. He says, what do you have to do with life or death? These are all creations of the mind. And he says, this is called giving up of desires of enjoyment, either in this life or the next. You can see, if you have that kind of pronunciation, then this next one is, this Drishti Shrishti Vada is for you. Just one more, though I'm saying it's a post-Shankara development, it is a, a radical form of Advaita. In all the, generally in the Upanishads, you will find um, Shrishti Drishti Vada, the more conventional approach, like you found just here, what we read just now. It talks about it like a real sequence of things happening one after another. And we as individuals appearing at some point in time. Um, and life and death being very important. Life is where you work out your enlightenment. Death is the problem you are trying to solve. You know, attain immortality. The Drishti Shishti Vada completely dismisses all of that. It says it's just a dream. It's foolishness. It's hallucination. Step out. Stop it immediately. It's like you are being chased by the lion. And the wise man comes and says, wake up from this. No, I'll, if I to stop running, the lion will eat me. Let him eat you. Nothing will happen. Just see. <laughs> like that. They literally mean that. And there are people who practice this. But it is difficult. It's easy to talk about. It's a cool theory. But if you try to do it, it's very difficult. And uh, it's not recommended for people in the world. It's uh, recommended only for, if you have that kind of a mindset, only for uh, extreme renunciants. And there's one more beyond this. This is called Ajatavada, not even a dream, not even that the world is appearing to you in a dream. Uh, the way to understand it is deep sleep. So the way to understand Srishti Drishti Vada is our waking state. The way to understand Drishti Srishti Vada is the dream state. And the way to understand um, Ajatavada is our deep sleep state. In the deep sleep state, we talk about world or dream or whatever. Nothing is there. No world, no dream, nothing. Brahman alone exists, and you are that Brahman. So that's even more extreme. And then some Upanishads, like the Mandukya Upanishad famously, it supports the Ajata Vada or at least the Drishti Shrishti Vada. I must mention, though I'm, I'm saying that it is a radical theory, these are very radical theories, very rare and very uh, mostly not supported by the Upanishads. But however, um, someone, one of the greatest Advaitins, Madhusudana Saraswati, in his commentary on Shankaracharya's Dasha Shloki, the famous commentary called Siddhanta Bindu, uh, which is the, you know, the Advaita teachings in a drop. It's not a drop, it's a big commentary. But anyway, there he says, Drishti Shishti Vada Mukhya Siddhanta Eva. The real teaching of Advaita Vedanta is Drishti Shishti Vada, is the, that second one, to consider the universe as a dream. What Vivekananda just said here. Yeah. Oh, one more thing. By any of these means, this is an answer to what the question which Sri Ram asked. By any one of these means, you can attain realization. By you know, an, an extraordinary cool theory, Drishti Shishti Vada, Rajata Vada, you don't get a better improved Brahman, you know, Brahman plus, because I went, took the more difficult road. No, you don't. Um, 
it is the same Brahman you reach. If you reach it by Srishti Rishti Vad, if you reach it through simple dualistic devotion also, it's the same reality which you are touching. It's the same elephant which you are touching. <laughs> so that's the beauty of it. Then one might say, then why take up these extreme positions? One is, if you are willing to cultivate that very high level of vairagya, detachment, these positions will make your path to enlightenment dramatically shorter. It's just one step away then. All right. Sandhya, how can Brahman be limited by its own potential? Uh, because it's not limited really. And uh, it's not even a potential really. Potential is when something is less and it's a potential you manifest it, it's become bigger or greater and final. I mean, I have a lot of potential and if I work hard at it, then I can become more learned, more you know, artistic, more musical, better orator, um, more rich, whatever. Those are my potentials. So I clearly have become better. I manifested my potential. Brahman is not like that. Even when this entire universe is manifested, so-called Brahman's potential is this vast universe. Brahman is exactly the same. Not one more thing has happened. If you have, if you have a movie screen, and on that movie screen you play the most, the best movie, the Oscar-winning movie, has the movie screen become a little better by that? No. If you play the worst movie, nobody wants to see it. Has the movie screen deteriorated by the playing of that awful movie? No. So. What is meant by limitation? Limitation just means apparent association with Maya from our perspective. It veils the real nature of Brahman in that sense. Because the more, more greater danger is to think that association with Maya and the production of the subtle universe, production of the physical universe, gross universe, all of it is somehow Brahman is expanding, becoming bigger and bigger and better and better. Not at all. It's exactly the same Brahman. Patrick says, uh, what, how, what explains the huge difference between enlightened person and sincere seeker is convinced as only Brahman? Uh, so the sincere seeker is still struggling, doesn't know it yet. We are still looking. An enlightened person has found it and then feels. It becomes a living reality for that person that I am Brahman. And then they can behave accordingly. So that behaving accordingly shows, that's what makes for the enormous difference which Patrick is talking about. The Jivan Mukta and the Sadhaka. Sadhaka is improving himself or herself, trying to become a better, um, a less selfish person, more devoted to God, deeper meditation, and trying to understand and live as if that I am, I am Brahman. It's all a struggle because the deep feeling is I'm still this limited being. But for the enlightened person, that feeling itself is gone forever. The enlightened being no, clearly sees without the slightest effort, slightest doubt, slightest hesitation, that one limitless Brahman and I am that Brahman. It's always available to that enlightened person. And so they really have no problems at all in life. Um, Shiva Priya says, enlightened one, Stita Pragya is living always with knowledge, I am Brahman. But spiritual seeker, knowledge cannot live with this always. Yes, is that it, Swami? Yes, yes, that's it. Subrata says, a swelling of Brahman can be explained as the Ananda, the union of Para, Shiva and Shakti. And that's also true from the Shaiva, uh, Shaiva perspective. Pradeep Bose says, a sequence of steps described implies time, in which step is time created. Yes, so time, space and um, uh, causation, causality are all in Maya. So they are deployed in the creation. So there's a sequence. And the sequence implies time. Krama means time only. And that time is already there. It's the basic structure of Maya. Maya is Sattva Rajasthamas. Maya is uh, time, space, causation. Amira says, after realizing the nature of the self, when we are surrounded by the inexplicable power of Maya on a daily basis, there's a choice to witness it and, or, and step away. If we decide to engage in the material creations of life, career, relationships, how do we play our roles and remind ourselves not to get trapped in this illusion? Yes, that is why um, Nididhyasana is very important. You realize it and you stay with this realization for some time until it becomes effortless. 
there'll always be a tendency to get swept away. But what you're talking about is a pretty advanced uh, stage where the already clarity has dawned. Then how to make that clarity a part of our daily life? Live it. For that first stage would be Nididhyasana, Vedantika, non-dual meditation. Uh, to immerse yourself in clarity and stay with it before you take it out for a spin in the world. Rajendra says, Swamiji, how is Vivartavada different from Avikrita Parinama Vada of Vallabhacharya? Uh, they are actually different. Vivartavada is a theory of causation held by Advaita Vedanta, and this Avikrita Parinama Vada of Vallabhacharya is a theory of causation held by Shuddhadvaita Vada. Um, Shuddhadvaita means pure Advaita, but basically it's pure dualism. <laughs> Dvaita. Um, what it says is, that ultimately Na, Vishnu or Krishna is non-dual. And this entire universe is nothing but Krishna. And it's real. Krishna has become this universe, literally. You take what the Upanishad says, take it literally. Uh, Krishna became the causal creation, subtle creation, and then this physical creation. Really? Yes, really. But then in that case, Krishna has changed. No, Krishna has not changed. How can something change without changing? Literally, you're saying this. That is the meaning of avikrita parinama vada. Avikrita without change. Parinama change. Without change, change. The theory of without change, change. And, and there's an answer to that. He says, you are thinking about worldly things. Worldly things cannot change without changing. They don't, they lose their nature if they transform them. You know, yogurt, milk can become yogurt. It's no longer milk. It's transformed. The seed can sprout into a tree. It's no longer a seed. It's transformed. Um, but Krishna can become or, or Vishnu can become this universe without being transformed. And that's because it's divine. Um, I can see some of you rolling your eyes. Yes, that is the right response. That's the theory. Uh, see, that's the whole question is how do you reconcile what the Upanishad just said? Everyone accepts this Upanishad. The Shuddha Dvaita, Dvaita Dvaita. Uh, Advaita of Shankaracharya, Vishishta Advaita of Ramanuja, Advaita of Madhva, they all accept this Upanishad. But you can clearly see, if you really dig into this, that imperishable, completely unchanging, it swelled, and then it produced a subtle universe, Hiranyagarbha, and then it produced a physical universe of tremendous diversity. All the examples of a spider, of a human body, of the earth producing uh, herbs and shrubs. They're all examples of actual change. Uh, so, But yet the imperishable cannot undergo these actual changes because first of all, the very nature of pure being, pure consciousness, how can there be a change? Second, if there is a change, then the divine has lost its divinity. See, there is a clear reason why the religions, dualistic religions, Christianity, Islam, they say God is transcendent. Then they deny that God can be immanent in this universe. If God is immanent in this universe, if God is transformed in this universe, then God is no longer God. That's the problem with pantheism. How do you reconcile these two? Either you have to sacrifice God, that God is separate and this universe is separate, to protect the transcendent, perfect nature of God. Or you can divinize this entire universe. Then you have to explain how God is this entire universe without losing God's divine nature. One answer might be what Vallabhacharya said and defend it. Defend it with a lot of logic. God is not like your ordinary things. Can be transformed into the universe while retaining its divinity. All right. Um, how do I make sense of that? Well, because it's God. Well, <laughs> uh, Advaita Vedanta gives answer is Talk about two layers of truth. Ultimate truth, untransformed Brahman, and the lower truth is like fiction. You know? So all sorts of things can happen in fiction without affecting the ultimate truth. On the same paper, you can write lots of stories. The stories can have talk about many things, but it all remains the same paper anyway. Same movie, movie screen. You can play lots of movies, but the movie and the movie screen, the story and the paper are not at the same level of reality. Then you can have change and changelessness. There's a world of changing universe, but there are appearances in Brahman, which is changeless. Appearance and reality can coexist together, even if the appearance contradicts the reality. The reality is unchanging and the appearance is changing. They can exist together if one is real and one is appearance.
But if two are real and they are contradictory, they cannot coexist together. It can't be both really changing and really unchanging. So there are a lot of these theories. Another theory is that parts. In part, God is unchanging. In another part, God is changing. Immediately you'll see the problem. Oh, so God, Brahman has parts. Anything that has parts is compounded. Anything that is compounded subject to change and destruction. So God will die in one someday. So these are all problems. I think Shankaracharya's approach, uh, Advaita approach is the most logical, which is why it is it's accepted philosophically. The rest are relegated to theology. Uh, Subrata says, can material cause be characterized as Sat and intellectual cause be characterized as Chit? Uh, no. Uh, sat, Chit, Ananda are the very nature of Brahman and they're the very nature of Ishwara also. Then the intelligent cause is Ishwara plus Maya. Ishwara plus Maya. Kostabi says, thank you for your time and generosity. Kostabi here, do you teach the Upanishads from an Advaitic philosophical basis? Absolutely. This is one thing we must be clear about. Huh. So what we are doing here, all these texts, for example, Gambiranji's translation. Um, it's a translation of the translation of Shankara's commentary. So I'm explaining Advaita with the Upanishads from on the basis of Shankara's commentary. Shankara's commentary is an Advaitic commentary, classical Advaitic commentary, yeah. So non-dualistic. So that you always have to keep in mind. Kiran says. The austerity of knowledge, is it in reference to Saguna Brahman? Nirguna Brahman has no attributes? Yes. See in this uh, mantras, how smoothly he shifts from Nirguna Brahman to Saguna Brahman. Akshara, with, you know, beyond uh, all qualities, is Nirguna Brahman. And the next he says, Bhuta Yonim, the source of all beings. That is Saguna Brahman. So it is Nirguna Brahman which itself appears as Saguna Brahman. Saguna Brahman is Ishwara or God. Parul says, last lecture you did except from Vairaga. Yes, this is what I read. Just now again I read. Motherhood and faithful student pairs of opposites, I feel sometimes. Oh, yes. So that's why motherhood, you, if you're a parent, you're helplessly tied, you know, by the bonds of affection to your own children. Don't struggle against it. Use that as a doorway to spiritual development by seeing God in them. Not by saying they don't exist. They're figments of my imagination. You can't do it. And it would be disastrous to try it. Rather, do it in a skillful way. What Vivekananda says, see divinity in everybody. See divinity in, in the child, in the people around you. That's a much better way of... Uh, and that's also true. Siddhartha says, is there a dreamer or only a dream? The individual being who is a dream... Ah. Is there a dreamer or only a dream? Answer is in your own dreams. Think about your own dreams. You are there in your own dreams. And that you, the person in the dream, and the world of the dreams are both appearances, part of the dream. So from that perspective, there's only the dream. Really, there is no individual dreamer and the uh, individual dream world. However, there is an underlying reality to this whole dream, which is the dreaming mind, which throws up the dream. When it throws up the dream, a world is created and then you are put in the world. Both you in that world and the world, both are appearances of an underlying mind. So the underlying mind is reality, that's like Brahman. And we, the individual being and the world which we experience, both are appearances of Brahman. Like Vivekananda said, one only exists. It appears as nature, soul. Nature, soul. Object, subject. But both of them are only one thing. Consciousness or Brahman. Um, Swami Brahmananda, when he went to Vrindavan, did spiritual practices, was following the Shti Shishti was. I don't think so. <laughs> uh, all right, we'll leave it here. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Arpanamastu